ladies and gentlemen, apes and sapiens alike, coming at you live from the heart of the Forbidden Zone. Put your hands together for talk of the planet of the apes. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, oh, so oh, Thank yes. you very much, my crowd. Thank you. Yes. Oh, my goodness. You're She's... here just for me, not Daniel. <laughs> She's being the ham now. I've converted her to ham. Oh, my goodness. I thought over the course of this podcast she would lose enthusiasm, but in reality, I'm converting her to the church of monkey business. <laughs> hey, don't say that word. That word is out loud. Monkey business. No. 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 <laughs> anyway, welcome. Welcome one, welcome all, from Chimpan A to Chimpan Z to talk of the planet of the apes. Last week, we discussed the hit 1970 film, Beneath the Planet of the Apes. And this is a podcast where I, one of your hosts, Danny, and Winter, the other lovely host. Other lovely host. <laughs> yes, the lovely, we are co-hosts here on this podcast presenting to you talk of the planet of the apes. Where we <laughs> see, I love that it's a title that works as like a verb. Yeah. Like, you know, this is just talk of the planet. It's of just the apes. talk. What do they talk about? Nothing on serious, talk of the planet just of talk. The apes? Well, you know, they talk of the planet of the apes. Yes. And uh, particularly in this uh, first mini series, we, we're considering doing a season two at some point, maybe mm -hmm. for the more. It's in the works. But this first series is primarily focused on the original run of Planet of the Apes films, the original five movies. And this is episode three. Episode three, where we are discussing escape from the planet of the apes. Da, 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 da. The 1971 film. Directed by Don Taylor. Don Taylor. And if you've binged, listened to all three episodes so far, including our little taste test, Oh, in the our very beginning, our patient episode, zero, episode zero. Um, you get a gold star of simian approval. <laughs> oh, yeah? yeah. <laughs> That's it. You made it to episode three. Here's a star. Here's a star just for you. There you go. This is also written, much like the previous film, by Paul Den, British screenwriter. And it is, again, produced by Arthur P. Jacobs. We get the return of Roddy McDowell in this film as Cornelius. Mm -hmm. Our boy, yes, Cornelius. He's the a, he's a sweetheart himself, the he's greatest sweetheart. boy. Posh sweetheart. Kim Hunter returns as Doctor Zero. Mm -hmm. We also get some other people, and we'll talk about them later in the movie. Yes, because one character in particular, when he appeared, that actor, I started losing my mind. My notes start to become gibberish. Uh -oh. All caps, all bold. You know, Jerry Goldsmith has returned yet again for music, and. uh I think I think we should get right into some of this production history, Winter. What do you think about that? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Lay it on me. Oh my god. Lay, Lay it on, on me. me. All right. So, as we know, if you listened to the last episode or you watched the previous movie, and if you haven't, what are you doing? Go back and what listen to that other episode. What are you wasting your time? Go to your podcast of choice. Download the previous episode immediately. But for those of you who already did that, mm -hmm. we all know how that movie ended. The whole planet of the apes blows, blows up. up. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing above, below, or inside the planet of the apes. Nope. Nothing. It blew Nada. the fuck up. But 20th Century Fox wanted a sequel nonetheless. Mm -hmm. They saw money. They saw dollar signs. They wanted dollar signs to the planet of the apes. Indeed. And Roddy McDowell, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the documentary that comes in this DVD, box set behind the planet of the apes yes said that the producer arthur p jacobs got uh paul ben back saying apes exist sequel required that was mm. the whole letter that he sent to him oh my god apes exist sequel required and he the, the paul den decided that the only way to uh to bring back the planet of the apes like mm -hmm. the storyline is to have cornelius and zira go back in time after fixing taylor's spaceship before the earth was destroyed indeed so that is that is the loophole there's the premise in which this movie exists that which that... brings us 
to a spacecraft discovered by a helicopter in the ocean. So the ocean, there's a body of water. Mm. There's return of yes, the bodies we, of water. When we get to discussing the plot, which is Just very a little, ta- little taste, <laughs> little taste. Continue. My research of uh, of of the the production history of this movie isn't super extensive. I couldn't find as much as I could for the previous movies. Mm, okay. it, it's kind of brief. Yeah. But um. But essentially, that that is the setup. They were just like, all right, this is the only way that we can bring this franchise back is to have it have some sort of time travel element Mm -hmm. to bring these characters back. And while he's writing it, then uh, contacts Pierre Boulle, another European, the guy who wrote the original novel that the the whole franchise is based on. Mm -hmm. And uh, he asked him if he can imbue the screenplay with satirical elements. Mm -hmm. Some of the stuff, some of the tone that his original novel had, which I mean, very, very much comes through in this movie. Absolutely. Uh, it's a lot more tonally in line with maybe the tone of the book uh, in like the silliness of it. Pierre's original image. Right. So the screenplay, which was originally titled Secret of the Planet of the Apes, was written to accommodate an even smaller budget than the last film. Mm-hmm. Because yet again, they've received another budget cut. I think they're operating with a budget of two million flat. Last wow. one was two point five. This one's two million. So they they lost basically like a quarter of their budget. Oh my gosh! <laughs> a fifth of their budget. Whatever you know yeah. what it is. And uh, having fewer apes and uh, fewer fewer apes involved, which required less makeup. Indeed. And bringing in director Don Taylor by having it have more of like a focus on the chimpanzee couple and so now you have um the apes uh, like the more comedy aspects that are uh the fish out of water right. now you don't have the humans who are fish out of water in a society of apes it is vice versa which is also requiring much less um sfx preparation fittings all that different kind of stuff now you, now you got yes. like a, a good drama slash comedy yeah. a dramedy you get like a like a courthouse drama mixed with like a sitcom. Yeah. And uh, then while he was writing this this more silly movie, mm-hmm. was like, all right, maybe the latter part of the film should have a lot more higher stakes. So they introduced the idea of like Cornelius, Zira, and their son, uh, mirroring like the the conflicts, uh, references to racial conflicts, and uh, the story of Jesus, like baby Jesus. Indeed. So, Which also, I have so many notes on that. Oh, you do? Yeah, where Zira and Cornelius are basically Mary, Mary and Joseph. Joseph. Yeah. Yeah, you know, this is going to sound crazy coming from me, being that like the religious and political stuff is the stuff that attracts me to these movies sometimes. Yeah. That I didn't pick up on them being J- Jesus, Mary, and Joseph really? until researching the production history. Wow. Like my, none of my notes Dude, say anything about it. it was so loud. It was as loud as the upside down crosses in the mutant humans really? from the last movie for me. I don't know. I think I was just so distracted by like the stuff that was really hitting for this movie for me yeah. was the first half. Right. So when the second half stuff was happening, I guess my mind was like wandering mm-hmm. and I didn't. I don't know how I didn't pick it up. Like, it's obvious now in hindsight. Right. But like, I don't know how I was like, yeah, no, yeah, this this is dark. Like, oh, I was yeah. like, but. And also it had me questioning like, all right, there's Mary, Joseph and Jesus. Who, who is God or what is God? Right. In this stance. But continue. I think I maybe, maybe the act of God, and maybe we could talk about this when we get there. Or maybe we'll talk about it now. Yeah. But the act of God being the fact that they've time traveled back and my theory and i don't know if you have this in your timeline because i know you've been taking notes on the timelineness of mm-hmm. this franchise <laughs> is that uh this is changing the timeline moving forward absolutely that the, the 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 apes movies that follow this are a new timeline from mm-hmm. the what the previous ones were and i think they 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 dig into that deeper in the next two films yes but we get we get the beginning of that here and i think maybe that is god that is God sending them back in time in some way. <laughs> is that God as an entity? God as a metaphor. Or God as a metaphor as in like the science? Like the act like... of God. of, of Oh, like, like the, the act of a power that be. Right. This un- this thing that they couldn't have controlled. 
Right. Send them oh, back in time. Almost like I was talking about nature. That's right. Personally. Like nature, the universe or whatever, <laughs> yeah. is the act of God that sent this pregnant woman with her husband mm -hmm. back in time with an intelligent ape that would change the course of evolution. That's kind of what I think the Jesus, Which Mary, and Joseph is. Is the basis of the lore from the first movie. We will get to that. Uh -huh. We will get to that later. I have a lot of notes on that. I know you do. I'm very so excited we're gonna to get talk. to that because <laughs> pretty importantly, the biggest lore drop of the history of this Planet of the Apes universe mm. is done halfway through this movie. Yes. And I'm sure we have we both have a lot of notes on that because that I'm excited to see if you're going to reference the same thing that I'm referencing. The, uh we'll see. It, it's halfway okay. through the movie. Yeah. We, we, we will I, see. I'm almost certain we both have the same notes. Okay. But uh, yes, so Kim Hunter, who had to be convinced to return for the last movie as Zira, mm -hmm. uh, didn't have to be for this one. She loved the script from the beginning. Oh, nice. So she was already on board. And uh, she also stated, I was very glad I was killed off and that she wouldn't have to come Aww. back for the future films. Man. <laughs> that Zero was done. Uh, she said, despite the friendly atmosphere, that she and Roddy McDowell felt a sense of isolation on this movie because hmm. they were the only ones dressed as chimps. Oh, so they felt kind of left out that no one would talk to them or include them on stuff because they were the only ones. But also that just reaffirms <laughs> what their characters are going through too. At the same time, like they, all right. they have is each other. Yeah. And, and, and that, I feel like that tone comes across really well in the movie. Yeah. And do you want to know, uh, the, the production timeline for this movie? What? So this movie started filming in November 30th of 1970. Yes. And wrapped filming on January 19, 1971. Huh. And this movie came out in 1971. Wow. And <laughs> That is crazy. So because of the low budget, production was rushed and filmed in less than six weeks. But also keep in mind, I mean, you're basically filming. There, there isn't as much obstacles as to creating this planet that doesn't exist, creating this landscape that doesn't exist, and creating... Or in replicating a species that also doesn't exist. Right. You're not struggling with that as much. You're more so just on Earth with a majority of humans. And yeah. there's not on much. locations. Yeah, there's not sets. much left there. Right. And uh, so the film earned $5.5 million wow. at the box office, which is not a huge number, but it is. That's a number, though. It is double the budget. So it may, it broke even. Wow. Right. Which is. Not what big studios want to hear, but it was enough to warrant a sequel. Uh, it it is considered, according to Rotten Tomatoes, the consensus of all the of the of the critics that it aggregated, mm -hmm. one of the better Planet of the Apes sequels. It is more character driven than the previous films and more touching as a result. Absolutely. The New York Times, as opposed to its review of the first one, which I find this fascinating because critics. Whenever critics lampoon a movie and then it goes on to become a classic mm -hmm. and they talk about the sequels, they act like when they reviewed the original one that mm -hmm. they, they liked it at the time. Mm -hmm. When, as we know, the New York Times called the first one a stupid movie that was fun to watch. Right. The New York Times gave this one a positive review, calling it quite beautiful with the theme of human guilt, richly ambivalent. With the theme of human guilt, richly ambivalent because the monsters were scarcely monstrous, but the guilt is a function of unassailable strategic intelligence. Hmm. Basically, writing it in a flowery way that this movie is very good and it makes the humans scary. <laughs> it does make the humans scary. I was like, as I'm watching this film too, as just a general um, consensus, right? I felt weird watching other humans treat them this way. Does that make sense? Right. Like, as in the first two movies, mm -hmm. you watch the apes essentially treat the humans in a monstrous way. Right. Which is supposed to replicate the way that humans act in, in human nature in general already. Right. But now you take the human's typical nature and you actually give them an opportunity to show them in action doing it. Mm -hmm. It equally felt wrong, but also at the same time, it felt even more monstrous and isolating for the people watching it. And you also get the sense that like 
the the villains in this are motivated purely by like greed and purely oh, yeah, by absolutely. like like th- there was no reason for this film to take that dark turn no other than the fact that the people involved were being inherently like evil mm-hmm. and prejudiced against these these beings that came from the future and also on top of that you know there was this um desperate uh urgency to protect the future that they can't even see yet right and then there's that argument of well do we just pawn it off because we're not going to be here that that's not a future that i'm going to have to worry about or do you take action and you change the course of history thinking that it'll possibly serve a different result but you still won't know exactly and it and it also has a it serves as a like a way to criticize how politicians behave because mm-hmm. we get to see a lot about the president and stuff and we'll talk about that when we get into the plot but like we see how the people here that are pulling the strings and being evil are doing it in a very diplomatic and political way mm. because they're leaders and this is what we do it's our duty but they're using yeah. it as an, as, a, as an affront for selfish goals mm-hmm. which is fascinating and and I think uh, I'm going to read a couple more quotes here from some of the critics. Sure. Uh, Gene Siskel from Siskel and Ebert, like a legendary critic. You know, he's famous. Mm-hmm. I, I don't really read his work or anything. I, I, I kind of find a lot of the writing, especially from this time about film, to be like very hit or miss. It's mm-hmm. Kind of annoying to me sometimes. But he wrote, comparatively, it is much better than the second, which was awful, but not as good as the first, wow. which was quite good. Huh. Which tends to be a lot of people like if you go to Letterboxd right now, a lot of people kind of say the same thing. Where they're like, I didn't like the last one, but this one's fucking good. And I'm just like, huh, I don't know. Yeah, fascinating. But <laughs> a lot of people say that. Hmm. Uh that tends to be a lot of people like shit in the second one. And I think some people like consider it the worst. I, I like it a lot. But and I think we both liked it. Don't consider it terrible. Like, I don't a lot, consider it a terrible, lot of people no. consider it terrible. No, which is I weird. wouldn't say that. And uh variety. Also, almost essentially says the same thing. An excellent film, far better than last year's follow-up and almost as good as the original Planet of the Apes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Los Angeles Times writes that it works largely because McDowell and Hunter are so good in the makeup that their performances are amazing as the chimps. Yeah. And uh, the monthly film bulletin wrote, infuriatingly, Escape from the Planet of the Apes continues the downward trend of a science fiction series that started out with such ingenuity and promise. The film is painfully sentimental in its attitude to the chimps, with Kim Hunter and Roddy McDowell overplaying and vulgarizing their former roles to the point where it's hard to feel much concern about their final destruction. What? The, this review is claiming that the thing that's wrong with this movie is the emotional stakes, the sentimentality, and that it caused him to not feel bad for the ending. What? That, that's an oxymoron. This, this is my favorite thing about That is so reading. hypocritical because they're saying that the, the emotional high stakes of the film is what made them feel disconnected emotionally? Yep. They're oh. saying that the, <laughs> the, the performances playing up the sentimentality. What? had made it hard to feel concerned for when they get fucking killed. <laughs> Whatever. Which is what I love reading old reviews because you look at that and you're like, how could you have missed the mark? Well, I mean, so here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. At what? Remind me again. Is this 1971? Yes. Where are we as far as um, abortions and women's rights in 1971? I guess the same place that we would have been in the previous film because it, it would have been like less than a year later because it is a bit more taboo and it is a bit more uh strictly driven right um so i feel that 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 review may be coming from a place of essentially the end of this film which spoiler alert um ends in a afterbirth abortion like a baby execution I mean, just executing a baby uh, straight up a baby execution <laughs> with a gun and maybe because of that it, it it delivers notes of confronting the topic and those suppressed thoughts 
regarding the the topic that isn't widely talked about as much as it as it is now, yeah. especially with women's reproductive rights. So because of that, it just feels like it's coming from a place of a uh, of male male issues. So I I I I hear what you're saying, and I think yeah, that makes sense. You know what I mean? I I think and in all fairness, I don't think that the that was funny. Something just fell over in the room next to her. But um, there's no one else here besides us. That was the ghost who did that, I assume. But um Roe versus Wade would have is is a Supreme Court case that would have only happened a couple years later. Right. Which is all about women's reproductive rights. Yeah. And it I don't know if the screenwriters were thinking about that kind of stuff at the time. No, maybe. I'm not saying the screenwriters, I'm saying the critics. Maybe the credits are com- are coming from a place of they're bringing that with them. Yeah, they're bringing that baggage with them, and that's why they're emotionally disconnected because they don't want to align with even the slightest thought of dealing with women's pr- reproductive rights or exactly. even women in general. And and maybe sometimes these critics thinking about that stuff causes chairs to fall off of tables and for them to actually like, feel things like ghosts <laughs> next door to us while we're recording this haunting the studio yeah oh my goodness but yeah that's that's enough of this malarkey from the from the critical reception at the time yeah whatever that was <laughs> whatever this shit is yeah well anyway winter do you want to get into discussing what this movie's about sure so a spacecraft is discovered by a helicopter in the ocean yet i actually i think the f- opening shot of this film is insane because it, it starts with the cliff yeah. From the first movie where the Statue of Liberty was. Yeah. And then it bait and switches it because you hear a helicopter come by and then boom, a helicopter flies past that cliff. Yeah. Like almost has to be like, this isn't this isn't the original Planet of the Apes. This is something else. Right. There's people here. And yes, then we see almost the same shot mirroring the one in the first movie where the spaceship crashes into the water. But now it's in the ocean on that beach on earth we're having the an same ocean spaceship, moment again another ocean moment you wrote something about the ocean moment um yeah ba- it's write? basically the the same thing of what you're saying like the um Mirroring. it's a yeah it's just a, a repeat symbolically speaking right right yeah and i i think that's that's sick that they they they're bringing back like this imagery from the first movie mm-hmm. it's already only a few years later and it's iconic Right. Like they're just like, hey, remember this? Remember this? Member berries? It also reminds me of, um, you know, that epic uh, piece of cinema, Space Chimps from 2008. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Did you write that in your notes? I wrote Space Chimps exclamation point. 2008. <laughs> I shit you not. Those of you watching at home with your ear sickles, I know you can't see this, but she did. Her notebook literally <laughs> says Space Chimps 2008. But but yes, the entire U.S. military shows up at the beach to see what this crashed spaceship is. Mm -hmm. Like many, many like Humvees and tanks and Jeeps and everything shows up. Generals show up. Then three astronauts come out of the spaceship and remove their helmets. Oh, no. The Marines look on in shock. It's apes. Didn't they believe that they were returning? No, they they were welcoming them to Earth. Oh, okay. I thought maybe I misinterpreted that. That I thought it was the um, oh, they, that they, they thought, thought that the was... astronauts were like Taylor or oh. someone from a previous mission. Maybe, yeah. I think so. You, that's why right. they showed up with all these reinforcements, not as a threat, as a welcome, but to welcome. Right, which but is what then, they say. Yeah, as soon as they they take off their helmets and it's revealed that it's chimps, there's that level of like ball well, dropping shock. I think their reaction is hilarious. Mm -hmm. And the credits start to roll over everyone reacting. And like they're the apes are all just like Which by the way, I think that's (laughs) one of the most Twilight Zone moments of this in in the entirety of the five movies. Really? I would argue that, yeah. What's that? The the moment where the credits hit? Yeah, where the where it's like that punch. Yeah. Well, it's like seventies like funk music. It's like yeah. Seinfeld music, and they're just like, boom, 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 boom. and they're just like, "Whoa, isn't this so weird?" Oh. As the camera pans by, the credits of the actors appearing over them. It's yeah. like a sitcom. It's so good. And then we cut back and forth between like 
like the message, the telegram reaching like a, a, a base, a military base, and they're passing the message on. And every time someone re- like gets the message that the astronauts are apes, mm-hmm. they're just like, what the heck? What the heck? The astronauts oh, we see that apes. montage of um, all the news reports, too, yeah. at one point. <laughs> Where it's in all different languages. Yes. Oh, that's a little bit later here. But yes, I do yeah. want to talk about that when we get there. Um, but then they're transported. Yes. To... The zoo? It, it's like a... Not at first. They're transferred to a military base at first. Right. And they're given... They're like or- a jail. Oranges. Yes. So the, the, the they give them uh, oranges and they eat it with a fork and But they knife. eat silverware? <laughs> and I wrote... Uh, the the general and lieutenant are very funny because yeah. they're they're re- they're acting like like Jay and Silent Bob or something like they're yeah. ridiculous, and then the apes like they side eye them as they're like ha- as they're handing them the oranges as if like the humans are acting weird. Which, by the way, uh, just for reinforcement, it's Cornelia Zira and Doctor Milo. Doctor Milo. Doctor yes. Milo, who is the one who fixed Taylor's ship before yes. the bomb dropped? Yes, and uh. The, the three of them sit down at a dinner table with silverware and eat f- oranges with a fork and knife. Mm-hmm. I wrote, this is hysterical. This movie rules. I wrote, this is hysterical. <laughs> For some reason, Zira is unable to speak. Oh, I wrote that before they reveal that uh, Cornelius has told her not to speak. Right. He's telling her, like, hey, don't speak. We're going to break their brains if we talk. Yeah. So, um, but then they are brought to the LA Zoo for inspection. Yes, to talk to talk with uh, ape psychologists and like the, vets. Right, the human doctors give Zira, uh, Zira a series of tests, which all of these, by the way, in reference to um, what we previously discussed, how mm-hmm. lobotomies are okay, but behavioral studies are a no. Right, like they're not interested. The humans do purely behavioral studies. Right, and the chimps are almost like. But it, like it's fascinating to see Zira's reaction because she's almost reacting as if this is childish. Well, also Zira does these exact tests, but she she aces all of them exactly because she like, knows oh, exactly. Stupid humans. <laughs> <laughs> also, I love the they're they're put in the zoo in a cage next to a gorilla, mm-hmm. and the gorilla is a uh, uh, just a man in a gorilla suit from that SpongeBob episode. Exactly, it's the same costume. Yeah, the exact same. They costume. rented it from the same store. <laughs> but yeah, the the. The Dr. Milo is the one who I guess came up with the idea about like, hey, don't reveal our secrets. Like, mm-hmm. don't reveal the future to these people because but Zira the- accidentally speaks anyway. Yes. So she does she does the shapes and the holes game. Yeah. And she does it with this ex- I wrote extreme levels of sass. <laughs> and it's good. And it's good. <laughs> it's good that she's doing it sass. This movie, I was laughing out loud for like yeah. an hour straight. It's amazing. And the the Zira speaks. What what does she say? Did she write, did you write it down? No, I don't have the exact dialogue. I don't remember what she said. I didn't write it down either. But when she does speak, the uh, the female veterinarian just faints. Mm. <laughs> She's like, oh, and she falls over. Yeah, which is so good. Let me see. Yeah, I don't have. Yeah, the, 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 I don't have it written down. What she says. There's no I way forgot. of knowing. If only the internet existed, but. Oh, this well. podcast is being recorded in 1988. No, 3955. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. 3955. Um, and then all of a sudden, the gorilla goes ape shit and fucking we kills have, Milo. <laughs> we we lose another third character in the first 20 minutes yeah. of the film. So Milo is choked by the ape in the cage next door, mm-hmm. to which the human doctors will perform an autopsy. And as they deliver his body, they don't even cover it with a sheet or anything. Right. They just, pull they just it out deliver him cot. like a specimen. Yeah. On a stretcher. Yeah, essentially. And um, and also, this what makes this so traumatizing, though, is we mostly see Zira and Cornelius' reactions to it happening, and they can't do anything. Right. They're, they're too afraid to go approach the primal gorilla. Right. Because they, they view it as like, it's primitive. Yeah. Right. And um, yeah, the, the, the vets even say like, hey, make sure you check, uh, check his brain in the autopsy. Yeah. Like they, they want to study that. And this, this is the moment where we cut to a, to a scene where the president is briefing his cabinet mm-hmm. on the news of the apes. Yes. Not the other way around. It's not like a scientist is telling the president. The president found out about it first. The president somehow found out about it first. And I think that's funny because no way, <laughs> no. no president in the history of America has no. ever done that. And um, 
this is where we get that montage you were talking about. Which one? Where we see all the journalists from all the different countries. Oh, yeah. And all the different um, types of families around the world gathered around to the, the TV, news. reacting to the news. And I like, I don't know, I like that scene. I love it. I, I think like, it's great. It's, so, it's, it's a silly trope or whatever, but I think it, it's done so fun. Yeah. And I actually think it's done in a somewhat like grounded manner mm -hmm. for a movie like this. Right. Like it's done in a way that like makes sense like yeah. it, it, that, that is what those reporters would be saying they don't have all the information and it's delivered in a way where like we're watching it's almost like we're watching like a biopic of something that happened mm -hmm. like we're watching like it, like a movie that's it's escaped the realm of sci-fi and has become like a courthouse movie yeah. you know what i mean and i think that's neat hmm. i think that it's pretty neat um Zero and Cornelius, they are also introduced to psychiatrist Lewis. Yes. Who is going to be a pivotal character for the rest of this journey. The the there it's like a like a husband and wife veterinary psychologist, maybe? Or they um, they're not married, they're just friends. That wasn't really established. It was more of just like a They're just hanging out? A, yeah, like a distinguished um partnership. Right. That is purely platonic and business. Like for science. Yeah. Um, they seem to hang out all the time. I'm sure they, I'm sure there's tension between them. They think about it. They think, they think about it. Uh, it's also revealed that the U.S. ship belonged to Taylor. Yes. As well. At this the, point. Like the, 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 the military now knows that. Yes. Whereas the, the characters, like the, the I, I wrote here that the, the movie does a really good job drip feeding the mm -hmm. exposition of how they got That's here. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Like, like we spend a lot of time not fully sure, mm -hmm. like how they got there or what's happening. And I think that's cool. Yeah. Like, I, I think it does a good job doing it that. It slowly unravels. It doesn't force feed you. And we, we get a scene where Lewis has to bring the two apes before a cabinet. Indeed. Like the president's cabinet. And uh, th the big testimony says is uh, that he's, infer he's like and i have to inform you sir that these two apes have developed the power of speech mm -hmm. <laughs> and i think it's so fascinating to see the parallel from the first movie of the court case with taylor right um being basically uh exposed in front of the ape cabinet right um with zero rights whatsoever and now we have Zero and Cornelius, two of the, uh, I would argue, the most beloved apes uh, that we've been introduced to in this entire in the previous franchise. Movies, yeah. um, they are now being almost respected. Like they're, they're not necessarily given rights directly, but they're not either, but they're not being treated like, um, even though they're chained to one another, well, they, they are they're still allowed to be presented in court and they still aren't being like gunned down or stripped naked or anything of that nature like the apes did. But I think I think poignantly the movie is trying to, to show how like even though it's more quote unquote civilized, like it's not medieval. That it's not any better. It's not any better. No. Exactly. But like, I'm it, not, it's yeah. not. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying. I'm like, not it, defending it, but. I am like stating it, the differences. It, it's showing the dichotomy of like two evils. Yes. Like two different ways to still uh, be, to still uh, infringe on someone. Like what was the word? To still be prejudiced against someone. Yes. That, that, that's what I was looking for. And I find it funny that the zoologists are expecting the politicians mm -hmm. to come to the scientific conclusions as if like politicians would know how to get anything done but like, ha like they would know how to even draw scientific conclusions exactly like it, the 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 movie is presupposing in a way i think is hilarious and maybe showing of the times that this is a more naive time yeah that like the politicians are the ones presupposing like the definitions of things mm -hmm. like as if like they in reality the zoologist would be the one to know better right. <laughs> which is funny uh cornelius reveals his power of speech with the sitcom sh joke and i think that's good <laughs> and he was, uh, he said something along the lines of um only if she lets me yes so the, zero is the one that speaks mostly and then someone says uh does this one speak and he goes only if she lets me and then everyone starts laughing and yeah. i lost it yeah. i had to pause the movie because it was i had to stand up and walk in circles <laughs> i was having such a good time that's so good. That's so good. 
And after that, we cut back to that office where they go back with Lewis mm -hmm. away from all the reporters. Right. And Azira immediately tells him about the future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like she just can't, she can't keep it to herself. Even though they promised not to do it. She's like, by the way, we're from the future. Oh my God. And Lewis is the one who reaffirms to her that perhaps that isn't something that everyone else should know. Right. That shouldn't be revealed. And then now this is established even further that this is supposed to be a secret. Right. And that unfortunately <laughs> unravels later on in the film. Right. Um, where she is uh, drunk and, and reveals that story. Yes. And in, in, I think one of the interesting, I think the line that she says is cool. Yeah. That is, is meant to be like journalistic and then political looking, like in the eyes of the times of this storyline, mm -hmm. is that uh, when she's addressing the, the court, she says, we are peaceful creatures and we are pleased to be here. Yes. And she lifts up her shackles and she says, may we be unchained. Mm -hmm. And I can tell, like, that was, like, at, in the sort of universe of the story, the way this is delivered has, like, such a front page news yeah. style thing. Like, it feels like it, in, like, a movie like, um, not the social network, but, like, a movie like that, this would be one of those moments. Like a... Um... Trial of the Chicago to kill, Seven. Or... To kill a mockingbird? There's yeah, something like movie. that. Yeah. Like the, the... Where it's like, it's like a huzzah kind of... Uh, like they're moment. trying to get the, the the reporting of this is just as part of the story as oh, what's happening to them. Got it. And uh, we, uh, we see that there's one chairman on that board that seems to take a special interest in them. Mm -hmm. We don't know why yet. We don't know why at the moment. It almost seems like he's sympathetic to them. Almost. As of this point. Yeah. But uh, we see him on TV, and when he's on TV talking to a late night talk show host, <laughs> just like us, just like this, this here talk show right now. Uh -huh. Oh my goodness! Uh -huh. Welcome to Talk of the Planet of the Apes. Whoa! Welcome back. Oh my We've goodness. been here the whole time. But yeah, he goes on like one of these late night shows. And he talks about and he talks about infinite, infinite regression. regression theory, which is bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. What? <laughs> like he goes on TV. And the guy is like, how, how does it make sense that someone can come back from time? And instead of explaining it, like infinite regression theory is a thing. I'm going to make and you it makes sense. <laughs> but this smug asshole politician on TV, instead of just saying like, well, you know, sometimes we view time in a linear way and they just happen to come back on the other way. So it's like, instead of explaining it in a way that would make sense to like the host or like a viewer, he just goes on about infinite regression, about like an artist painting a picture of a landscape, but that doesn't show the full truth. So I need to paint a picture of the artist painting a picture of a landscape, but I no, painted but... that picture. So it does the whole infinite regression thing in a way that like he explains it, but it has nothing to do with what the guy asked him, which I well, find funny. That's the thing. It's just, it's a, it's a political tactic of deception. It's basically yeah. overcomplicating another concept. And describing it in great detail so you don't look over here. It's just sleight of hand. Yeah, it, but, it seems And he's like also trying to put himself on a pedestal as well. Sounding intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> but also, to touch base on infinite regression, he explained it as um, there's an artist who painted a landscape. Yes. And something's missing. So he decides to paint himself into that landscape. But then he realizes that that does not complete the full image of him painting the landscape because he is still painting the landscape. Mm. Therefore, he continues to paint himself into the landscape nonstop. And it right. never ends because it's infinite regression. It's a consistent looking back on oneself. Right. Ta-da. So. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, 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 I want to make sure you had the full point. I don't want to interrupt you. I have a lot more to talk about as far as About that? that? I do. In this movie? In all the movies. Really? Okay. I'm interested to hear that going forward. Going forward, I will talk about it. Listeners, you will just have to stay tuned to hear me babble like a maniac about infinite regression. Mm -hmm. But Daniel, please continue. So I'm going to read exactly verbatim what my note is right here. Uh, the one chairman who seemed intrigued by the apes takes a moment to explain infinite regression theory on television. Rather than simply explaining how time could possibly move in two directions. It comes across like he is fucking with the reporter to confuse him. It's never brought up again mm -hmm. in the text of any of these films. It's never even referenced. Yeah. Which is why 
I found it so funny that this movie took like five minutes to explain it Mm -hmm. for what I interpreted as no reason, but it seems like you were able to build a thesis on it. I was. Okay. And I'm very excited. I'm interested. Yes. (laughs) And uh, this cuts immediately to the apes getting a hotel. Monkey in a suit. Monkey in a suit. Monkey in a suit. (laughs) Cornelius gets a fucking dope suit from a tailor. Here we go with like the typical shopping sequence, but like the best shopping sequence you've ever seen. I said, I wrote, that's good stuff right there. (laughs) <laughs> and then um zero was she gets invited a to a uh a she gets women's a nice panel suit. yeah and i was like zero for women's rights zero's preggers yeah, <laughs> they wrote she, that two, two wrote, bullets within each other <laughs> i wrote she got spiffy as hell with a red velvet suit and cape hell yeah we cut to a hotel having a full-on fancy people party with giggling at bad jokes mm-hmm. and wine and it cuts straight to cornelius in a robe watching tv and a shot that is infinitely funny. But on a more serious note, though, you get to see Zero and Cornelius. Basically, they are on the top of the world right now. They're, they're at the top of their A game and they're being platformed at their apex. So the only way to go from here is down. Well, they're they're being put on a pedestal and they're putting they're they're being treated with like material luxuries. Mm-hmm. But in reality, Earthly they're prisoners. Pleasures. Yes. Yes. But like just because they're being famous and they're being treated well right now, it's it's like it's an illusion. They're just making their cage more comfy. That's they're all. just putting them in a fancier cage. Yeah, exactly. And we we see like the shot of Cornelius watching TV in a robe. Mm-hmm. So funny. <laughs> I send that picture. It's you on a Saturday. Every single time. I like it's the picture. It's a reaction image that fits in any context. It's a beautiful image. Of Roddy McDowell and the fucking ape makeup with a rainbow suit. It's the best. The rainbow, like, robe. Then we cut to Zira being a feminist icon. Absolutely. Love <laughs> Le- her. Leading, like, a women. Like, this, I think, would tie into, like, the women's suffrage movement and stuff like that. And that's what Not I was women's trying. suffrage, but, like, Roe v. Roe v. Wade. And- that's what I was trying to touch base on lightly before we start diving into the plot. Um, it's definitely. She's, like, a, a female intellectual. Absolutely, yeah. And she's being put on this pedestal as this like this absolute female icon. Right. And um she's like an intergalactic female icon. <laughs> yeah, which is exactly. which is awesome. <laughs> uh, but also not to mention, like now that we're at this point in the conversation, it does make a little bit more sense for my argument as to why that critic would say the things that they do. Because I think it's a patriarchal problem. Like it, it comes from like a misogyny in a built exactly that would view that as like uh transgressive yes absolutely and um while she's doing that while she's leading these like these feminist speeches we cut to cornelius watching boxing yeah he's he's discovering he's he's watching (laughs) violence for sport and it it horrifies him yeah he doesn't like it he thinks he thinks it's 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 animalistic and it's very um, primal we cut back to zero like getting a tour from like a professor in a museum mm-hmm. and um she faints she faints because she sees a taxidermied ape it mirrors the the taxidermied man yeah from the first film when taylor dodge. sees dodge dead yeah. and and she faints and you think like oh it's the horror of it but it's because she's, she's preggers omg <laughs> that's what i wrote <laughs> yeah but i wrote preggers too I wrote, <laughs> that's really shock, da, 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 because she's preggers omg g, g, g. <laughs> and um but then I find it funny yeah. that the very next scene, she gets back to her hotel and oh, immediately and Lewis. she's like, give me wine. I want to drink. I want to drink grape juice plus while pregnant, while pregnant, grape juice plus insane. Yeah. Grape juice plus while pregnant. Uh huh. And but Lewis doesn't stop her. It's not Lewis. I thought it was Lewis. It's the it's the bad guy. Oh, it's the guy from the cabinet. Yeah. So it's the guy from the right. cabinet who we thought like up until this point, it seems like he's like intrigued by them but he just starts feeding her wine and then pulls out a cassette oh, player recording. and starts recording her he well actually he does it in this really sneaky way he where he goes like, to pull out a cigarette he goes he's like you mind if i smoke actually you know what not in front of the baby you continue drinking your wine though exactly like, what the yeah. hell? <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought that was so funny what okay but he, he gets her to admit that what 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 does he get her? He gets her to scene? admit that um, uh, mentioning the the year when the Earth will melt, 
And he brings it back to the president. Yes. So he gets her to admit like what she saw when she was leaving, right? Basically, That the yeah. earth was exploding. When the bomb was going to explode. And he brings it straight to the president. And this scene was fascinating, if, if, not, if not a little perplexing, because again, like we said before, the president is portrayed as like very capable and intelligent in this which is something that like we as Americans haven't been aware of for like decades. Uh So it seems weird to watch. Right. And uh, so he is debating with that guy over the politics and the optics of going public with this testimony. And also, would you alter the future? And they list an example of being assassinating Hitler as a child. Like, like even if we had the opportunity, would you go back and kill baby Hitler? Is like one of those questions those philosophical ones. Right. And, the president brings that up mm-hmm. and and he is uh he's straight i wrote he is strangely intelligent and well-spoken <laughs> <laughs> wild how the depiction of the u.s president was this at one point but the, he, the he president bring, is more grounded than his cabinet yeah the president seems to be more like intelligent more wise but he also is like transparent in the idea of like hey like this is going to be bad for re-election mm-hmm. we need to we need to be careful of the optics where that rings very true to like even to oh, this absolutely. day. Oh, absolutely. I expect nothing less. And I, uh, I, I wrote, he brings up a lot of philosophical questions. I just know that this would give Joe Biden, Trump, Donald, an aneurysm. But then. Like, our, <laughs> they would die thinking about any of these questions. <laughs> it's revealed after referencing Hitler that they decide to bring them to a CIA camp to be interrogated. Yep. It's called C11. I called it Gitmo. AKA Concentration Camp. Guantanamo <laughs> Bay. Yeah. Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> Uh, in this interrogation, though, is where I thought the moment that the the following movies and even the current movies are being based on is first uttered. Uh huh. Is this what you we mentioned this earlier? So they ask Cornelius to detail the history of how apes got into power. Right, and and Cornelius I was... has a monologue. Yeah, he talks about how um, apes became pets to humans after a plague killed all the dogs and cats. Right. Two centuries later, they had evolved um, to being butlers and servants beyond tricks to societal functions. Yes. And in this story, he has this monologue and Roddy McDowell delivers it with such like grace and gravitas. Yes. So well. And uh, he, he details how this ape named Aldo uh, was the first ape to articulate against humans and it started a chain reaction that caused a rebellion ape named aldo yes he said aldo he said aldo and aldo was the ape who said no really he stood up and he said no against his human captors that's what he says huh it's fascinating and we'll get to that later because aldo is a character in this franchise Wait a minute. Yes, we'll get Wait to that. Wait a minute. But yes, oh my God. that is what Cornelius says. He rewrote history. And this is, well, this is the history as he knows it. But Aldo rewrote history. Right. Because well, Caesar was the one. Aldo who didn't about. rewrite history because Aldo doesn't get to rewrite history when we get there. But who did? The gorillas? I, so my thesis on this, we'll talk about when we get to the fifth movie. Oh. My take on this <laughs> is that it's a metaphor for like the, I think the next two movies are supposed to be like a metaphor for myth making mm-hmm. and like how over time things the the interpretation and like the way we tell stories over time things get it's like remembering a memory mm. things get mixed up numbers get changed names get mixed up different things get remembered as legends that maybe didn't happen can you do me a favor and bookmark this until the fifth movie? So oh, I, I have it bookmarked. Because I, I have a, I have a whole argument for you. Because <laughs> I, I think that this is either one of two things. Yeah. I think there's the one side, the extremely like nerdy, like, like early two thousand side, where we have to make it make sense in a timeline, explain it with like converging timelines and paradoxes, or the other side of it is the side I'm going to go for. Because mm-hmm. I think you're going for the timey wimey stuff. I'm going for like the myth making, like fantasy stuff. I'm gonna keep my, I'm gonna keep my theory quiet like, for now. Yes, and the, we'll have a lot to talk about. When we we'll have, you'll just have to stay tuned. Yes, you'll just have to stay. You'll tuned. have to stay tuned for the for the following episode. So, basically, after the interrogations, though, Zira is given truth serum. Yes, and she reveals all secrets to her scientific experiments on dead chimps and living humans and their connection to Taylor. Yes, that they loved Taylor. And, but what is most importantly, what the thing that the humans take away from this is that she admits to dissecting humans. And, and on top of that, she lied in court. 
Yes. yes. And uh, because of this, the board, like the, the board of trustees or whatever these politicians are, the Supreme Court looking thing, they decide that uh, they are going to chemically castrate the apes and they're going to abort the baby that she's pregnant with. Correct. That is the only humane way to go forward, mm. according to them. According it's not to humane them. at all. It's no. fucked up to be like, yeah, we're going to cut your balls off and we're going to like poison your wife so that she can't have babies anymore. Like it, it's not humane and it's not giving them a say in their own body, which is no. like what you which were Which is exactly out. what my argument yeah. was earlier too, as far as that one critic who yeah does not know what they're talking about <laughs> it, i i think i think it, it, it it's very interesting i didn't even think about that's such a good point you brought up that i didn't even think about that uh when i was watching it but you're you're totally right especially because this is the time that the roe v wade stuff is building up to yeah the, like, the tensions are rising right and uh what we see is that we cut back to cornelius and mm -hmm. we cut back to um zero yes who are in a prison and their orderly walks in and he looks and talks exactly like JFK. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly like JFK. Yeah. And he refers to their baby as a monkey, like jokingly. Mm -hmm. So Cornelius fucking kills him. <laughs> yep, he hits the he takes the tray of food and he he does it. Remember that thing that I did in um Angel of Asgard, the he, BTS. He fucking whacks him with the with the lunch tray. Adam, if you're listening, remember that time I hit you with a slate? Yeah. <laughs> That's he, the way. Cornelius fucking yeah. kills JFK, dude. <laughs> he kills him. And then he runs away and escapes. Slaps him upside the chin with yeah. a metal tray. Smacks his head on the brick wall. Yeah. Uh, I don't have many notes in between this. And, and Zero and Labor? Yes. Yeah, me do too. You, do you have any notes in between there? No. So essentially, like fast forwarding, whatever they escape, they run into their vet friends, Lewis yes. and the and the and Stevie and Stevie, and they, which, by the way, yeah, another blonde that kind of sounds like Stewart, <laughs> really, <laughs> from the first movie, Stewart. It's a S T uh, S T E name. Who's Stewart? Stewart's the blonde chick from the that died on the way. Remember, Tate, You're the right. first yes. Eve. I thought you were talking about Taylor. I Come was like, on, you fake fan. I, what can I say? <laughs> well, uh, this actress, she's also plays one of the mutant council members in the previous movie. Yes, but she's very pretty. In the upcoming movies, she plays Caesar's wife. So yes. this actress is someone who's oh, in... Oh, she plays um, Lisa? Lisa? Yes. Aww. So she's in all of the movies except the first one. That's it's awesome. Super cool. But they, she and uh, Stevie and Lewis bring Cornelia and Zira to a friend where they know the that local they'll circus. be safe. While giving labor, and who, who else, but Ricardo Montalban? Oh boy, here we go. Is the fucking ringleader of the circus. Here we go. His name is Armando. He's a fucking giga shot. I love him. <laughs> He's the best, and he knows the entire plot of the movie. When he arrives on screen, he already knows everything that's happened. Yep. Ricardo Montalban, absolute god among men. All right. The greatest showman of the, the planet. The greatest games. <laughs> showman. All right. From Fantasy Island. All right. From Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. All right. We're talking about we're talking about Mr. Rourke himself. The 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 legend shows up. And he is the nicest, awesomest dude. He's like, yeah, absolutely. Give birth to my circus. He's the good I'll side of the patriarchy. Immediately. <laughs> He's an ally. He's the ideal man. He's the ideal man. He is amazing. I love him. He's awesome. So. And Zira gives birth to a baby. Her son, Milo. Her son, Milo. Named after their good friend. Dr. Milo. Who got fucking choke slammed by a gorilla. gorilla. <laughs> and he's the cutest thing ever. I love the little baby. It's yeah. a real baby chimp. And it's, a, although animals on sets is like not super humane, it's clear that they didn't make it do. Mm -hmm. any weird shit they just held it like a baby yeah there wasn't any like crazy tricks that it had to do right so it wasn't necessarily humane i don't know i'm kind of like neutral it, like they it. didn't do anything presumably that didn't that want was, to that that harmed this baby hopefully yeah. but it's the cutest it's the cutest little monkey which by the way it's so cute this franchise yeah as far as animal rights 
I feel like would be the first, <laughs> the first people at the front of the line to fight for animal rights. Right, to not like, hurt an animal. <laughs> context wise, and like every every person who worked on this movie too, I feel like that's just the vibe. Yeah. So the fact that they had real chimps, like real baby chimps, and a real mom chimp. Was there, a real there mom was chimp? a there was a real adult chimp with the baby. Oh wait, no, never mind. It no, wasn't. it was a person in a suit. Oh my god, it was. Yeah. It was a person ah, in a suit really holding convincing. a baby chimp. I just realized it. Huh. <laughs> you, you, I really thought you had to have known. No, I, really I think you're, thought ma- it was. you're maybe misremembering. Me- well, I think it just because they had a baby one, it just convinced me. It made it feel enough. more real. Yeah. Because they, they do go out of their way to make the primitive apes mm-hmm. in this look more like apes that we know today mm-hmm. and not entirely like Cornelius and Zero. Right. Which is cool. It, mm-hmm. It's a it's a good touch. And they, they push that forward in the next movie. Mm-hmm. But um yeah, no, I mean, Ricardo Montalban gives Cornelius a cigar. It's fucking hard. Yeah, because he's he just became a father. He that's a the father, thing to do. He gives him a cigar. And, and that, that's so awesome because one of Milo... One the awesomest moments. Uh, not Milo. Um, Armando, I feel like, represents not only, like, because he's a, a man, but also he's just one of those freaks, quotation marks, of society. He's not a freak. Because he works in a circus. He's a true gentleman. Like, if you talk about society society speaking, like on the oh, basis like he, he's, of... Oh, he's trodden upon? Like, he's not... Right, because yeah. he's a he's a showman. He's in show, he's show business. He's an outsider. He's an outsider. He's a traveler. Which is why he's, he's a more accepting. Exactly. He accepts the freak shows. He accepts the imperfections. And he right. loves animals. So he is the perfect person right. to deliver a chimp from outer space so and then treat awesome. the father of that chimp to a as cigar. an equal gives him a nice cube as an equal yes and then it's so uh, i mean the image of cornelius smoking the cigar like just him having a cigar yeah it's fucking sick man i love ricardo Mo- like the most manly awesome moment in the movie absolutely <laughs> it's so bad because it's funny but that, it's like, manly in a nice tender way he didn't not like, in a george taylor way but also at the same time like Cornelius didn't like the manly activities he was exposed to exactly. during his time of luxury. But what he did appreciate in that moment is like having that having that bonding moment of right. like celebrating becoming a father, which yeah. I think really says a lot. Right. Very tender. It's very awesome. It's very lovely. And I wrote, he brings such a lovely sp- Spanish flair. And he treats <laughs> the apes so lovingly, gives them a necklace for protection. Armando fucking rules. <laughs> I wrote like maybe five, six, six. Oh, no, six. And then I wrote some more notes later, all about Armando. Yeah. Oh, man. Armando is so awesome. But then Cornelius and Zira are on the run. Well, before that, yeah. Zira shares like a lovely moment with the other chimp mother oh that's right she got into the cage she gets in the cage yeah with the other chimp and they share a moment with their babies and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and then um and it's really sweet to see the primal chimp with the baby recognize zira she recognized her mother to mother yeah they they have a moment where even though they're they're from different evolutionary timelines it doesn't matter they still connect yes and uh as they leave cornelius uh, asks to be given the mercy of suicide if it comes down to it. Mm-hmm. And Lewis gives him a gun. Right. And then the two apes kiss the two humans. Yep. <laughs> and she's like, you, Zira says to Lewis, you'd be the second human I've kissed. <laughs> and then Cornelius goes over to Stevie and she's like, he's like, and you'd be my first. <laughs> and then they kiss, each, they all kiss one another. Oh man, that is the funniest. That is one of the funniest it's moments. Just, it's so, silly and wholesome it, it has and sweet it's a more wholesome version of the kiss from the first movie I'd yeah say. whereas the first movie was more like a joke about like the hero kissing the girl mm-hmm. and like they were making fun of that right and this one it feels like they were genuinely like i'm so thankful i need to kiss you but also at the same time ritualistically speaking this is something that they've observed right this is not their own tradition this is a human tradition right that they've adopted Still in funny. their own silly chimp way. <laughs> would you would you kiss a monkey if a monkey if a monkey was like your best friend for a couple days? Absolutely, I'd I kiss. would. Are you kidding me? If the if they were intelligent enough to ask to kiss. <laughs> yeah, it's, it. Listen, if Cornelius came up to me, <laughs> and he was grateful, he was like, for everything I that must I thank you. With. Can I give you a kiss? I loved. That. I say yes. Um, 
I mean, thankfully, that's not a tradition we still do nowadays with yeah. how creepy some with, men like, are. With like kissing on the mouth and right. stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, so, like with family or like with people with like love, loved ones, like kissing on the cheek goodbye Especially or Especially around the world, it's it's done mutually Super in, in different ways, yeah. But I just know that this tradition nowadays would be used by like the creeps and stuff yeah. like that. But, Unfortunately. but it's so funny looking back at this and being like, this is just like, also this movie takes place in 1973. Yes. That's something I noticed that it takes place a couple years ahead. Correct. Which is funny considering there was an Apes movie in 1973. But <laughs> but yes, yeah, so Armando, because of, not Armando, Cornelius gets a gun. Mm -hmm. And they go off and they hide in a ship where. Which? Water. 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 Like you said. Water. They're back in the, they're, they're, they're thinking they can escape, right? They're Correct. hiding out there waiting for Armando they're to come. They're hiding out. So that they can take the ship and sail away. And Zira is then held at gunpoint. Well, before that, Cornelius and Zira share an exchange that I wrote here. Oh, what, what was it? Where um, he looks over to Zira while he's like looking out with the gun and he says, you don't like them very much, do you? And she says, who? And he says, humans. And she said, we've met hundreds since we've been here. And I trust three. And I wrote that down because it was so interesting that these these people who were like the sympathetic ones that were helping the even though they had their own like their own ulterior motives. Well, they they had their own ignorance about humans. Yeah. In the previous movies, they were still like the good apes, quote unquote. Like they were the ones oh, helping yeah, the humans. Right. They they have been done so wrong by the humans that their perception of them hasn't changed. Yes. Rightfully so, because they've been treated so cruelly. Yeah. And I wrote that line there because that was just an interesting an interesting uh, exchange that I wanted to note for this. Yeah. And immediately we get a, like a chase scene. Right. Where it's just two men slowly walking around with guns as funky music plays. And the cabinet, a, um, the person who was on the cabinet who got zero drunk. Right. Is that person who's on the, uh, on the ship. With like a gun, hunting for them. Hunting. And he wants to Sarah execute them. accidentally reveals herself where right. she is. Um, she is then held at gunpoint in an attempt to take her baby. Right. Because he just, he, he's like, listen, I'm not going to kill you. I just want to kill your baby. <laughs> which is. <laughs> which is fucked. <laughs> just want to kill your baby. <laughs> like, it's so casual. You know, I don't think he says that, but that's essentially what he's yeah, saying. Yeah, that, that, that's what's delivered that's what's communicated and there's as goofy as some of this is because it is the early 70s yeah a lot of things back then had really bad action and chase sequences mm -hmm. this included with like the the old james bond like slow real-time walking chase scene yeah with either no music and awkward wide shots or like synth music going like yeah. like whatever it is Funky. and it and but there are some shots where cornelius genuinely misses the doctor the evil doctor mm -hmm. who is like quietly slipping by him and those shots are actually very menacing yeah and then i wrote do you want me to read what my last note here is sure. for this scene go for it i wrote the bad guy shoots the fuck out of the baby man what the fuck and then cornelius shoots him so hard that his blood hits the lens and then cornelius also gets shot it falls like 30 feet onto his head. Not onto his head, onto his knees. No, he lands on his head. He, no, he lands on his legs and his legs bounce because the dummy bounced. Yeah, but he, he completely slams his head. Like he, he yeah. slams once he hits the ground, yeah. And then I said, dude, what is this? It's so dark and insane. What the fuck? I wrote, um, Zarian Cornelius are shot. Milo is shot multiple times. She throws her baby in the water before dying. And then the baby chimp at the end at the circus says mama yes so i wrote here all caps zero left her fucking baby with armando what holy shit <laughs> and the legacy of the simian yep. <laughs> population there is a shall secret continue. evolved ape living in the circus with armando absolute legend himself. yes indeed but man can we talk about how this movie went from being a sitcom to having a close up of a baby being fucking riddled with bullets. <laughs> yeah. In a rated G movie. Insanity. Well, they don't necessarily show anything. They just. They show a wrapped. It's blankets. It's, so you don't yeah, see it's gore. It's a wrapped 
but you yeah. see the squibs. You see the bullets going into the blankets. And I think she Zero throws the baby into the water so the humans don't get to it. Yeah, but the baby's turned to liquid. <laughs> the baby at that point, been, yeah. But oh she also God. she I don't want to say she disposes of it, but she like she throws it into the same water that that awful cabinet member also fell into, which as far as water symbolism as well, it's like the the washing away yeah. of the the destruction at hand. I I didn't I also I didn't realize that Zira dies at the end. Yeah, Zira she throws the baby into the water and then crawls to go die on her husband. But she never got shot. Yeah, she did. Did she? Yeah, she did. I thought she was laying on him to cry over him. But um, it, they do say in the next movie that she died. Zira Zira was shot. Yeah, Zira was shot at the same time as Cornelius. Okay. I, I She was shot before Cornelius though. Yeah, I, I I Yeah, she crawls over to die with her husband, but I I I didn't catch it while watching mm -hmm. that she died. I thought she went over to like cry. Yeah. yeah. But in the next movie they say like She's your dead. mother and father died and the yeah. all that stuff. I thought she died from a broken heart. Like Oh, like <laughs> Skipper. Yeah. <laughs> Poor or Skipper. Like, like like Anakin Skywalker's wife. <laughs> like, yeah. But it is kind of dark that Zira just kind of like let that other chimp baby die. But she it is the only knew way. Yeah. She where this was going. And right. she kind of switched out the baby as in like she's going to make sure that this her one. child lives on. Right. And uses the other baby as a target. As a human shield. <laughs> as, a, as a literal target. As yeah. a sacrifice. You're right. Which, I mean, that really, like, that's why I sent I sent a picture of me crying to Daniel after I watched <laughs> this film. Because I wasn't happy at the end about Milo, the, the intelligent baby chimp, living on. Like, my heart was still broken. The fact that Zero and Cornelius were gunned down. And that poor that you didn't register, yeah. baby chimp was just mauled. Like, <laughs> yeah. like no hope for that for that little baby chimp. And it's almost as if like it, Zira and Cornelius meeting Armando was, was the like fate a blessing, or like the destiny of that baby chimp. Yeah, it, it was. And now that that their baby Milo is now assuming the identity of. The baby chimp that was there. Correct. Who we find out is called Caesar in the next movie. But, well, he's only called Caesar because he chooses himself to be Caesar. He he was Caesar. Armando also called him Caesar. That doesn't make any sense because he chose his name. He chooses his name, the... but he's choosing his own name, like the name he already oh, has. Oh, he already has a name. So it, we'll talk about it in the next movie. Oh, okay. Because this is, now we're going to get into a discussion about conquest. Now we're going to get but, too far. But this this movie, I think this movie is really fun. Uh, you want to hear my summary? Yes. Give me a summary. Zira, Cornelius, and Dr. Milo crash land on Earth, somehow traveling to the past before the evolution of apes. Milo is killed by one of his... One of his... I don't know. Oh. Ancestors. Primitive ancestors. <laughs> While Zira and Cornelius go from being celebrities to America's most wanted, resulting in both their deaths and the death of their child, but the beginning of talking for chimps and the baby chimp at the circus. I like so how you write I, these. These are fun. What? I like how you write these. These are fun. What, in my dyslexic like the, fashion? No. Where I can't, I can't, <laughs> I can't no. read what I like, said. I, like, this should be like what's on the back of the box. Of the well, DVD. that's what I was going for. I yeah. was like, if I was to regurgitate this to somebody else, how like would I say? Yeah. And that's, that's what I was trying to do. Um, but the moral is humankind nor men has the power to ultimately alter nature nature will always find a way right um cinematic takeaway yeah. bodies of water equals danger <laughs> danger <laughs> danger in all capitals well i mean you're afraid of the ocean so that's your always your that is my your... kryptonite <laughs> if you stuck me in the middle of the ocean at night especially i'm just i'll kill over and die I, I literally i won't even try to swim i love the ocean one of my uh, favorite blockbusters recently has been aquaman avatar 2 Everyone's getting ocean pilled. I love the ocean. Um, <laughs> I rated this film an eight out of ten grape juice blosses. Nice. But this is my favorite one. Right. 
I'm going to upgrade it to a 10 out of 10. It's your favorite one of them all. Of them all. All right. Well, don't don't spoil your rating and uh, your ranking. Mm-hmm. We're going to get that. So you give it a 10? I give it a 10. Nice. That's cool. Because this one really this made me fall in love with the franchise. Yeah. And it really helped me understand. Like, it was delivered in a way that I really understood. What, right. um, like, the obligations of the society and um, the simian culture. Also, the implications of um, interpreting the simian culture through the human lens right. and also the um, com- uh, combat between the two, like how divisive the two cultures are as they clash. Mm-hmm. Um, humans reacting to the simian culture as well, like how would America react to this kind of thing? Right. Um, I don't know. It just made me think the most. It made me realize the most. And I really love the infinite regression part of it. Not for the reason that you hate it. I love it for a different reason, and I'll yes. get into it. I in the I, I think it's so. I I don't I don't hate it. I just think it's it's so it's funny because it's so stupid. But it's, it's used delivered. as a cinematic device to make him look like an asshole. Right. To but make I, him look prestigious. I think we think he looks like an asshole now, but it wasn't supposed to make him look like an asshole. But it totally did. It does to us in hindsight. It in does. hindsight but when i first watched it i was like are you kidding me right now i just had <laughs> i had the ultimate moment the I brain had, blast yeah that's exactly what i had i had nice. the grape juice plus moment so i uh I, I didn't say this in the last movie but last movie i gave 4.5 yes. out of 5 and uh, my review on letterbox was why was this heavy metal as fuck <laughs> <laughs> Good. so for this one i gave it four stars uh-huh which is a, a half star lower than the last one. And I'll, okay. I'll explain well, why. It's still up there. It's still good. I still liked it a lot. Yeah. As it's baffling that a film had me laughing out loud at several points and on the edge of my seat at others, had the opposite issue of the prior film, where it's the last third that becomes slower and less interesting rather than the first third. That being said, ending the film on such a dour note was fucking insane. <laughs> yeah, that was really bold. And the slogan for this film is cold as hell too. It goes, meet baby Milo. Who has Washington terrified? Huh. Like this this feels like an all the president's men version of Planet of the Apes. Oh, and to touch base on uh, we were starting to discuss Mary Joseph and Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um I just I think that we should uh, explore a little bit more. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add on that topic? Well, I think we we talked about it a good now amount at the beginning. Hindsight. At the beginning of the podcast, we delved into it a bit, how it's like the Roman government hunting down these progenitors that are from Mm-hmm. something greater than us being the future in this or right. in the bible it's god mm-hmm. and they're protecting him at all costs and i think obviously in the bible they don't find mary and joseph because they get held out in a in a barn mm-hmm. but in this they do and we get that classic like i think part of what makes planet of the apes these original movies uh tonally in line with one another mm-hmm. is they all share this deep nihilism yeah. This darkness about like that's the word of the day. The, it's nihilism. The, the destiny at the end of the day is bad. Mm. That it's all accelerating towards something negative. Right. All of them except one, and we'll talk about that. Yes. The new Planet of the Apes movies have that to an extent, but also have a lot more of a shimmer of hope to them. But we're not talking about the new ones. These old ones share that nihilism. And this movie pretty iconically has a pretty fucked up ending. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I I like this movie a lot. I gave it four stars. I I just think that uh, because of such the tonal shift from the sitcom-y nature of it to like this like James Bond chase stuff at the end, Mm. it threw me for a way where like I was left on a negative note Ah. where not negative, like where I thought it was bad. Yeah. Just like a more negative note. Like I went from laughing to being like sad. It was a pendulum swing. So you... uh, I mean, this is probably telling. If a movie has like a really good ending, but maybe the rest of the movie wasn't great, Mm -hmm. I will tend to give it more praise because the last thing I remember the movie is liking the ending. It's the ending, yeah. Like recently I saw the Boy Kills World movie, Mm -hmm. which is like a really fun action movie. But like that movie ends on such an amazing action sequence Mm -hmm. that like I bumped it up by half a star. Because I was like that last sequence. I felt that way about Monkey Man. Yes, Monkey Man. Monkey Man, the second half of Monkey Man is amazing. Absolutely. It's a little slow in like the beginning, but they're laying the foundation. You have to right. let them cook. Let in hindsight, that first half is better once you have the second half. Absolutely, yes. 
but yeah, that's that's a perfect example of yeah. like a, if any of you at home are watching modern movies, don't want to watch these old shitty movies that your parents <laughs> liked because hey, you're cool whoa. and hip and and I don't like what my parents like. My parents are lame and old. What the heck? They, I, I'm I'm talking about Gen Z. How they? Oh, act. okay. Like, why don't you watch some older movies like these and watch some cool mm-hmm. monkey business go afoot or whatever? I don't know. What am I even talking about? I don't know. We should probably wrap up this one though. Oh yeah, we yeah. we have any more thoughts? No, I think I think we can end it on Monkey Man. <laughs> yeah, and as I mean, well, uh, where can we find you, Winter? If we want to find more you of your stuff, you can find me on Instagram at Cinematic Witchcraft. Ooh. That was my Cornelius expression. Do you like it? Nice. Yep. Here's my Cornelius expression. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh my God! Oh, the floor is coming up real fast. What? That is such in poor taste. Okay. Rude. Salt in the wound. Oh no, a gun. Boom. <laughs> Ow. You're awful. No, but, um, I... <laughs> Way to end this on a sour note. No one's going to like this episode this now. This movie was so good. I like this movie. <laughs> I like this movie. Well, if, if you want to find me, I'm at DCR Films on Instagram. And uh, if you do like this episode and you liked my Cornelius expression, give it a five stars on your podcatcher of choice. And if you liked Winter's Cornelius expression, give us a subscribe and a follow and, and listen to all the other episodes. And you, if you hated both of them, do all of it. Do, do both if you hated <laughs> both of our impressions. Yeah. And as we say at the end of every one of these Talk of the Planet of the Ace episode, Mama! Mama! <laughs> oh my God. Get it? Like the ape at yeah, the end of the movie? Yeah, I get it. Yeah, it is yeah. clever. <laughs>